Okay, so it looks like everyone's back has been replenished with coffee and whatnot. Um, so this is a document that you have in your download folder. It's like O2 MLM underscore ML as opposed to base. So this is a markdown document that I created. I'm very proud of myself. I learned how to do markdown for this. I am new to R in case you hadn't figured that out. I've only been using R for about 18 months and at like they have been dragged kicking and screaming against my will into doing it. So I finally was able to get this working with his help. So uh, this should be something you should be able to take notes in and, and do as you wish. But it has all the code and all of my words trying to interpret things as well. So the data you also have. So you could run this along with this if you wish. But everything that what you need in terms of output to interpret is here. So again, I just trying to make it so you can just sit and listen and think as opposed to run and, and type and all of that stuff at the same time. So we have um, the example data from before. The only difference is that we are using a sum score rather than individual items. So starting off then with the document, the things that I like to have, I don't like it the significant stars or the scientific notation or anything like that. So we're using uh, the psych package to do some data description. We're using NLME to do generalized versions of multi-level models. LME4 to do multi the multi-level models for some scores, as well as Elmer test, which allows us to do linear combinations of fixed effects and to get Satterthwaite denominator degrees of freedom, which is supposed to be one of the better ways to do it in multi-level. I know that's not a thing in Bayes, but it is within frequentist world. And last but not least, a package I found that will give intraclass correlations without me having to fight with R to get them. And Levon to show you the multivariate version of the model in which we let free and reduced lunch as a predictor have its variance partitioned by the algorithm instead of doing it manually with observed variables. And for this example, we are also using a couple of custom functions that Jonathan wrote to do basic types of data manipulation things. So to add level two means and to compute pseudo R square and total R square. And those functions are inside your, your download folder as well so that you can use them as you wish. So we're loading the modeling data. Just one second here. There we go. And the first thing I'm going to do for partially descriptive purposes and partially because we're going to need it for free and reduced lunch is to use a function that Jonathan wrote called add unit means, which what it does is create level two means across the level one units. So cluster means of these variables. So the level two ID variable is school ID for which school is which. And I am asking it to take the individual student sum scores across the 10 items, as well as individual student free and reduced lunch, which is a binary variable, zero if they don't need free lunch, one if they do. And translating those into SM sum score, which scans for school mean, and SM free lunch. Then I'm asking for descriptive statistics on the original student level versions of those variables, so the level one variables, and then the level two means of those level one variables. So sum score is going to be our outcome, free and reduced lunch is going to be our predictor. So on average, they get about half the items right. The average of sum score is 5.72. Uncoincidentally, the mean of the school means is the same because he selected exactly 50 children per school. It will not be exactly the same otherwise necessarily. And the range at the student level is 0 to 10. So some students did not get any right, some got all of them right. The range at the school level, so these are school means, is somewhere between 3 and 7.5. So there are some schools where on average they got only three right and some schools where they got seven and a half right. So this is descriptively is the type of variation that the level two random intercept is trying to capture. School mean differences in the math sum score outcome. Then we also have free and reduced lunch as our binary variable. So min zero max one, as you might imagine. The school mean of that though ranges from 0 to 0.8. So there are some schools with no poor kids and some schools with 80% poor kids. 
So it seems like there's actually more variation in free and reduced lunch. So the fact that we have meaningful school differences in free and reduced lunch means that I can predict the interclass correlation is not going to be zero. It's going to be somewhere above zero, meaning that I do need to worry about separate effects of between school differences in free lunch from within school differences in free lunch. So this you can do, you know, even if you don't know multi-level modeling, just descriptively, sort of see how much variation there is above the level one variable. So I am going to center the school mean of free and reduced lunch at the variable's overall mean, which was 0.3. So on average, the schools have 30% poor kids. I'm going to use that to create a new zero point. So my reference school will be a school with 30% poor kids eventually. So that is what school mean free and reduced lunch 30 means. When I do analyses, I always try to add the centering constant to the end of my variable name so that I know what the reference is. And I don't have to remember that when I look back at my output. I am also creating now for future use a within school version of free and reduced lunch. So WS means within school to me. And that is the original 01 student level variable minus the school mean. So this is the purely within school grand or group mean, cluster mean, variable mean centered, whatever you want to call it, version of this. So, all right. Any questions on the data or the setup or the story? Cool. So first up, I'm going to do two versions of an empty means model. So I throw the word means in there to clarify that it's the absence of fixed effects specifically. Uh, under my demarcation of model for the means and model for the variance that I like to teach with. So I am first model just for demonstration purposes is an empty model with no level two variation. So note that the intercept here has only a fixed part, not a random part. So this is the simplest possible model you could ever have. It ignores clustering in the sum score completely. And what it should give me back is just the mean of that outcome variable and the overall vari variance of it. So I am using GLS right now because you can't have an absence of a random intercept in Elmer. It won't let you, it will yell at you. So if you want to fit any other kind of model in which you model the covariance other ways besides using random effects, you can use GLS. This is from the NLME package. So we have our log likelihood, which I would have to multiply by minus two to do anything with. My fixed intercept here is 5.72, which is exactly the mean of the variable, not a coincidence. And the residual standard error here, which would map onto the standard deviation instead, not a coincidence. So then let's figure out how much of that variation is actually at level two. Would anyone like to guess before we go forward? How much of the differences between students in math sum scores is actually due to which school they go to? Do I hear 0.5? Kind of high. Do I hear 0.05? Make it an auction. 0.1? I hear nothing. I hear nothing. I know you don't want to play. <laughs> You could literally scroll down and find the answer, and then you can vote with confidence if you'd like. Point three. Point three. Okay, that's, a, that's optimistic. Yes, thank you for playing. So somewhere between point five and point three is what we've landed on as a group here. So the model has changed by adding what? What makes this a multi-level model instead of a single-level model in my new little equation here? What's new? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with new. <laughs> Are we recording? Did we do that? No. Wait, maybe. Maybe we did? It looks like it's recording. Recording. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is green minimize? Uh, just click the other way. Don't minimize. Just click the other way. Okay, yeah. Again, Mac, not my strong suit. Okay, mm -hmm. rhymes with new. <laughs> you, yes. 
right here. That's the difference. So the idea is that the mean math score for each school has a fixed part, what happens on average, and u is the deviation of a particular school from that mean. So we're allowing schools to have different mean math scores. E is still there as the within school differences between children. So I've switched to Elmer. My model here, sum score is squiggle tilde equal to one. I put the fixed intercept in there to remind myself that that's the first term. That will come in handy when you do linear combinations. And then one in parentheses here attached to school ID means the random intercept. Now we get both regular flavor log likelihood and that value times minus two as deviance. So that's handy that they give both of those things to you. And now we have two lines in terms of variances and corresponding standard deviations. This is my random intercept variance. So 1.05 is the quantification of all the reasons why some schools do better in math than other schools on average. Within schools then, some kids do better than math than other kids, even after controlling for which school they go to, that looks like relatively more of the variability. And indeed we have 3,100 kids in 62 schools. Because the data are perfectly balanced, the fixed intercept is exactly the same, but that may not happen. So if you have different numbers of people per, per cluster, then it's a weighted mean that you get back here. So the way that I would interpret this is this is the mean of the school means. That's not necessarily the same as just the mean. The sum of these two variances, by the way, 1.05 and 5.5, are not exactly the total variance, but it's pretty close. So conceptually, I think you can think of it that way, that we had all of the variability in one level, and we've just split it into how much of it was actually level two versus level one. Yes? Um, what is the reason why it's not exactly the same? I, I've wondered this a couple of times. Why? It's such a simple model, it's not the same. Can you describe the um, residual variance? What is it called? Partialing? Profiling. Profile. Profile likelihood. Yeah. So. Can you answer that? Um, so in estimation, depending on the method used, the residual variance is sort of not estimated. It sort of drops out. And because of that, you get small changes in the result itself. So it's called profile likelihood itself. Rather than that, if you were to estimate it in, in certain packages, I don't know if you can do it in LME, but if SAS is proc mix, for instance, you can tell it, don't do that. And then the accounting becomes much more clean. It's, it's an estimated parameter and it works. But basically, we've switched from maximum likelihood to one to almost like at least squares for the other. And the difference in that causes some small changes in the actual numbers. That's the best I can give you for an answer. So it's mainly driven by the estimations, not not something that's, that's my understanding, yes. And I would expect in unbalanced data there would be a bigger difference between what the total is because, because of the differential weighting. Um, I will note that we have Remmel equals false. So in frequentist land for these, there's two kinds of estimation. There's what I call regular flavor maximum likelihood, and then there's residual or restricted maximum likelihood, which is only possible when you have conditionally normal residuals at every level. So it's really only a thing in multi-level models. Remmel, by the way, is the same thing as ordinary least squares if you have complete data. So it's the n minus the number of fixed effects version of estimating variances rather than n. The reason that I decided to go with uh, ML, regular flavor ML, is because then it's more directly analogous to what the Bayesian algorithm is doing because the likelihood function that is involved in building the posterior is the regular flavor maximum likelihood version, not the residual version. May I put it another way? In maximum likelihood, there's a small but consistent bias in estimating your variance components, right? You use an N as a denominator. In the Remmel, that sort of removes the bias. But in Bayesian, Although you could build a Bremel likelihood, it, it's not standard. It doesn't come in, and so this is the mm -hmm. analogous way. It matters more if you have fewer level 2 units. So as, as level 2 n goes up, M ML versus Bremel does not matter. And by the way, they are both full information. So like you've heard the term FIML, like F-I-M-L. 
For whatever reason, foremel is not a thing, but it should be because that it's also full information. Some people will say fimmel versus rimmel. No. They are both fimmel. They're both, yeah. <laughs> They're just foremel. I'm trying to make it work. <laughs> Yeah, trying to make it a thing. You heard it here first. Sorry, that's a lot, a lot of information. Yeah, well, he asked. Yeah. Careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so other questions. So, so now we have the basis of our answer to compute an intraclass correlation. So I asked for ICC from the performance package to do the math for me. And I did the math for you down here. However, I note that the numbers don't exactly match. The reason is because 1.07 here is not 1.05. I had started this example in Remmel and then changed my mind. Mm -hmm. So the level two variance from Remmel is 1.07. The level two variance from ML is 1.05, and that's the downward bias that he was referring to. Why that matters in very small samples is if you follow the logic, if the level two variance is too small, then all of the standard errors that go with it are too small, which means all the p-values are too happy. So, technical term there. Too happy. They're too happy. Too optimistic. Anti-conservative, is that better? I think too happy works better than anti-conservative, personally. But Wishful thinking. I, yeah. So we have our intraclass correlation from doing that math of random intercept variance for level two mean differences divided by that plus the residual. The residual is the same. Survey says about 0.16 is the intraclass correlation. So who wants to interpret that for me? And feel free to read from the screen while you do it. Sixteen percent of what? An ICC of point five would mean that within the two variance is equal. Yes, it would. And if I have an ICC of point one six one, then it means that I have more within variance than between. Mm -hmm. More within than between. Sixteen percent between, leaving eighty four percent within. So that means if I want to explain math as a variable, which type of predictor is going to be relatively more useful, people things or school things? People are level one, school is level two. People things. People things. 84% is people, 16% is schools. So if I want to go for straight explanatory power, I'm better off investing in people things. However, are people things just people things? Not usually. There are also school things too. So it's like bonus. You get both at the same time. So is 0.16 a lot? Do I need to keep it? This is kind of like an effect size. What if I need a p-value to go with it because I'm publishing somewhere where they need a p-value? Well, this is a model comparison. So the analog to ANOVA, which by the way is the dumbest name ever, has nothing to do with ANOVA to do likelihood ratio tests. I do not understand this. Are you this. hating on R again? Yeah, I am. <laughs> it's R ANOVA, or what I like to say is RANOVA, because when I work with R, I feel like I've been RANOVA. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. Maybe if we're from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm here all week. <laughs> so I've been Renova. It's going to do my model comparison for me. So two times the difference in log likelihood gives me a test statistic, which we treat as a chi-square of like 390. Critical value on one degree of freedom, if I ignore the boundary issue, is 3.84. So yeah, this is wildly significant. So we definitely need to keep the random intercept variance that is responsible for 16% of the overall variability. All right, time for Stan. All right. Hi. <laughs> Did you enjoy your break from Stan? Uh, I'm going to break, uh, I'll, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to have all of the details for this. I'm just going to go show how to frame this in Stan itself because there's a lot to that, as you know. Um, but 
most of the results that you'll see here, you could you could essentially take the text from this and recreate them from Stan. And they have all the files. And you them. have all the files. So this Stan file is the starts with O2 model 01. Actually, that is the empty model file. Let's start with the empty model. It's an easy place to start. That's very small font. Is the screen readable enough for everybody? Does it need larger? Okay, I should ask the back, yes. Is that better? Fantastic. Okay, remember we had three sections of STAN. We had data, we had parameters, we had model. And I like to go to model first. Turns out this model you may have seen before. Um, here in model, I phrased this STAN to be a bit more um, general. So you wouldn't have to import all of your predictors. So in that regard, Y is our data. In this case, it's the sum score for free and reduced lunch. And to follow along with the empty model from Lisa, this Y would follow a normal distribution. Now here, instead of having intercept, I've made a shortcut. Now this is a little bit more, needs a little bit of matrix algebra, which is if you haven't had it, I understand that's a brand new thing. You don't want to, if you don't want to do Bayes, you don't want to do that either, right? Let's just, but um, let me just explain it to you. Basically, the idea is if we give to Stan the X matrix, which this is a design matrix where we put our predictors, perhaps a column of ones for the intercept. And if we have any dummy coded predictors or, um, not dummy coded, reference coded. I hate using the word dummy. It feels like it's bad. Reference coded predictors. However, we can put it all into one big matrix and import that into Stan first. And then our vector of regression coefficients, as Lisa's been calling fixed effects, will be beta. One thing on that, though, as you note here, beta is no longer fixed because we have to give it a prior distribution. So it's an odd world to live in. I'll still use that language, fixed, because I do want to continue to be consistent with Lisa's multi-level uh, analogies. And I do like it. It is a mixed effect model. But when you're in Bayes, technically every parameter has a distribution. So there's a subtle difference between fixed and random. In this case, there are no what Lisa would call random effects, and yet every parameter is itself random. So it's a bit different from terminology-wise. But I'll continue with her terminology because, honestly, that is how uh, I think of it as well. These are fixed effects, but they have prior distributions. Well, it's a constant that adds to everyone's score, is the way I think about it, as opposed to a variable that adds differentially based on who you are. So in thinking of this, then, y is data. We know that we need to put y up in the data part here. X will be data because we've observed X this time. Back in IRT world, we, our predictor was not observed. So because of that, we had to call it a parameter. Here, X is data, so we import X into Stan. Beta is a vector of parameters. That is your fixed effects. In this case, we'll only have one. But technically, the way I've coded this, beta is also a parameter. So we can tell Stan how many columns of x we have, how many intercept plus uh, predictor variables we have in x, and beta will resize itself so it's the right dimension, so it has the right number of columns, the right number of effects. Rather than having to code every single slope with a different name, they're all just contained in this uh, set vector beta. So the code is reusable. It's reusable. Yeah. That's okay. right. Finally, sigma is the residual standard deviation. So in actually in LME, when you run a non-mixed effects model, it does say residual standard or standard error, I believe it says, uh, at the bottom. This is not residual variance. This is the square root of residual variance. So in calculating ICC or in calculating other uh, effects that involve variance, you'd have to take the square of this term. That's one of the, again, another annoying thing about Stan, but it's just how we have to, to make it happen. So sigma, again, is a parameter. How are we doing so far? I feel like I'm, I know, it's back to Stan. It's like, Lisa is over here, look at this. 
Yay, Lisa, and I'm over here. All right, let's talk Stan. And everybody's like, oh, no, let's not. No, it's on the formula line. <laughs> okay, it uh, it'll, it'll come back. It'll be there. Yeah. Uh, so sigma is here. Uh, sigma is a variant. So our two parameters are the set of <clears throat> regression coefficients, fix the fit, fix beta and sigma itself. So then we know data will be y, x. Here we already define p, which is the number of coefficients, number of predictors. And then we go up to our data line, we have some uh, mean and the prior, a uh, prior mean and a prior standard deviation for sigma. Again, I'm using a log normal distribution as a prior for sigma, just to stay consistent with what you have seen previously. Uh, and then I have, for each one of my regression coefficients, a prior mean and a prior covariance matrix. So remember, the prior reflects your belief on this. I don't have a belief. I mean, I just saw a belief. I could actually really do some data snooping and use Lisa's results to inform my prior. But let's pretend I didn't see that. I'm going to phrase this in a way that I have no belief. I'm going to make the prior very uninformative. And you'll see that in just a moment. So, uh, and finally, with Y, we'll, we also need to tell Stan how many observations we have. That's why the N is there. So those are our data. Finally, the bottom here, I'm phrasing a person likelihood. And this, again, if you remember the debacle that was before lunch yesterday, the, the person likelihood with, uh, which I fixed and I haven't shown you yet, but it's more consistent now. Um, this is for model comparisons. So if I want to look at um, LOO, leave one out, model comparisons, or WAIC, I can use this to compare a model with or without a uh, random effect as well. Okay, once you have that, the file that I have is the MLM uh, Bayes.r file. And in here, whoops, let me just show, I, I did the same as Lisa, added unit means, install some packages. Again, I'm depending on the psych package as well. I uh, add the unit means my data. Again, I print out the same output that Lisa had before. So this is trying to mirror her handout as much as possible with my R syntax. Uh, center our variables. And now I'm starting to, this stuff we will use next, but I'm just starting to bring this together. And the modeling data now has the following. Uh, variables in it. We have our frame reduced lunch score, uh, pardon me, all the way down here are all the variables we're looking for. We have our sum score, but then we have our, our school mean, we have our school uh, mean frame reduced lunch, we have the school mean frame reduced lunch that's been centered at 0.3, the constant, we have the wi uh, within school frame reduced lunch, and uh, we have a school ID as well, which we won't use the empty model, but we will be using just in a moment from here. Okay, so now, remember with Stan, we make our Stan code, we have to compile it, uh, just briefly do that. But here is the thing that Lisa likes. We need to give Stan, as part of our data, the X matrix. Turns out, R actually makes that a little bit easier for us. In, uh, if you're familiar with LM, if you've run a linear regression with R, you've seen this type of formula structure before, right? Well, we can go and take that formula and have R give us what it uses for the X matrix. And then we can give that to Stan. So what that means is, is any linear model that you can form in R with a formula, we now can run with a linear model with that Stan file that we just compiled, which makes it easy. Technically, you could run almost any linear model you'd use in, I think, almost, I think all the linear models. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he's saying all because it's easy to refute but the model matrix, there is a model matrix, model dot matrix function in R, which who would have any use for that, right? But here uh, we do, and it's quite handy. Um, the model matrix itself for us is relatively um, simple. I think I actually can use the word simple here. It's a column of ones, right? It is just for the intercept, right? So this is a design matrix essentially, right? So when we put that into our stand, remember that um, our stand file 
had this model matrix. Get this out of the way, move this over here, close this, pardon me for moving everything around. This is a column of ones. We know it has one column, so the number of coefficients is one, so beta will just have one value. So it multiplies the number one times beta everywhere it shows up, which just turns out to be the intercept. Any questions on that? Okay. So this is the dimension of our model matrix. And actually with that, we have two of the other pieces of information that we need for Stan. We have the number of observations, 3100, or n, and we have the number of predictors, or one. Even though it's not a predictor, it's just a column in the matrix, right? So then we grab our, our Stan code here. You'll note that um, I mentioned I like uninformative priors. How about a variance of 10,000? Sounds pretty good, right? So like put a mean of zero, but like the variance of 10,000. Yeah, I think we're probably going to be OK. We, we know the scale of our data is somewhere between. The mean's going to be somewhere between 0 and 10, because that's the, the sum score. So very, very uninformative prior. Um, similarly, we have a very wide standard deviation for the sigma for the standard deviation as well. So there's our data. Rather than just running the model, I'm just going to load it. We could run stan. And then we have to assess its convergence. It did converge. Hooray. That's better. a good R hat. What's that? Better. Yeah. Yeah, well. Given my performance yesterday, I'm sort of, oh, no, what happened? It's, it's one mean and one variance. That's it's right. My, the prior distribution of whether or not I'm going to succeed is very, no. <laughs> has a lot of variation here. Um, OK, so here are our results. 5.72 is our estimate of the, of the mean. Let's see how that compares with Lisa's 5.72. Hey, what do you know? That should be it. Um, it's from the previous model. Yeah, whoops, pardon me. Right up. Yep. Uh, right, there. right here. And residual standard error, 2.57 here. And for us, real close to that, 2.58. So you'll see that we didn't do a whole lot different this time, which is actually really convenient, right? So like, why would you use Bayes here? Well, probably you wouldn't use Bayes here, but wait till we get to tomorrow. Right? <laughs> Building blocks. Any questions? That's the empty model. Empty single level. Single level model. Questions? Let's make this multi-level, shall we? All right. How many of you says no? <laughs> Shouldn't ask that question, should I? <laughs> I'm going to make this a multi-level model. That's better. Um, OK, here, for the multi-level model, again, I'd like to, actually, this is model 03. I need model 02 right here. For the multi-level model, it's a bit more complicated. Now, there is a package in R, something called BRMS. I don't know if you've seen that before. It will run multi-level models more generally. Makes it easy, but in terms of trying to get you to build the model itself, you quickly run out of options in BRMS. It won't run what we want to run tomorrow, so I thought it would be better to go through the code as to how we built this multi-level model. And unlike the model where we had the fixed effects, this time I'm not coding it generally in a general sense for the random effects. Probably could do that and make it like BR BRMS, but I decided it would just be better to incrementally add the random effects. So now, we will go to the model part. And here, y, instead of having the vector y, we are now going to loop over all the observations. And the reason for that is because each person's y, each person belongs to a different school, or perhaps a different school. We need to understand which school a student belongs to. So instead of having our previous code where y was, didn't have a, an index or a bracket to, in, to indicate which person that, that y came from. This time, we are instead having to offset it. And that's because if a person goes to, depending on the school a person goes to, there's an additional term. We have a u, or a random intercept, for each person. And that is going to be relative to the school they're in. So if we know a person, we have something that contains which school they're in, and that tells Stan which random intercept to use. It'll be a different U from Lisa's slides for each person. 
But that doesn't stop me from keeping the fixed effect side the same. So I can leave that the case. Instead of now, I just condition, I take x. And just like in R, this bracket where it has two uh, parts to it, the rows are indexed by the very first part. So the observation is in rows. And if I leave the second part blank, it means all the columns for that row. Right. So you can do the same thing in R to subset your data. You probably, if you're familiar with R, you probably understand that. Um, so why is data? We have a set of fixed effects. In this case, it'll be the same set of fixed effects from before. We can use the same model matrix, just a column of ones. But now we need a U or a random intercept, which I literally just call it random intercept in the code itself. And that random intercept comes from each school. So we have the observations school ID. That is a variable that I'm going to have to input into R. But we have it in our data set anyway. We have a student ID, we have a school ID. Any questions? I feel like I'm talking too quickly. Okay, yes? So is random intercept a formula? Pardon me? The random intercept, is it a certain term or formula? Or? Uh, in this case, it's just a, 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 a random variable. It's almost like a theta. But you named it that way. Yeah, I just called it that. Oh, okay. Sorry, that is, pardon me, I misunderstood the question. Yeah, it's just, instead of calling it U, I just labeled it what it is. So random intercept. Um, Lisa's good at naming things, and I'm not. Yeah, Although... That is the name for it, right? It is. is. you know, day four out of five or whatever. <laughs> and we need to be explicit at this point, right? Although I did suggest our, our son's name. Yeah, so, our son is named Hugh. A uh, nod to his British heritage. So Hugh and you, right? Yeah. There we go. Uh, so random intercept is a is a random term in R, and it is uh, determined by the school ID for the observation. So school ID is a set of from the data that we'll have to supply as well. So random intercept itself then gets a prior distribution, and this is where in multi level we have to remember what the prior distribution for random intercept is. Here, every u in Lisa's slides, u was fol followed a normal distribution, always had a zero mean, and Lisa described the variance as tau squared sub u, right? So instead of calling it tau squared, I just call this tau intercept because with the normal distribution, Stan makes it a standard deviation. So we have to square it if we want it to be a random, inter random intercept. How are we doing so far? So I'm looping across all of the schools and I'm putting a random intercept in for each school itself. We have 62 schools. So we have to actually tell Stan how many schools we have. Yet another piece of data we have to add. And we have a random intercept to describe it. Finally, so this is our between school variance. Okay. Sigma now becomes within school variance. Right? So in the model line itself, we have our level one observation. It has a level, uh, we have our observation, Y. This is a student's observation, so I guess it would be a level one observation. And it has a level one variance. And then we have our level two effects, random intercept, and it has its level two variation as well. Okay? So similar to all the other code from before, the random intercept I will use the uh, variance tau intercept, in this case standard deviation. I will again use a log normal just to keep things consistent with a mean and standard deviation. Both of those need to be input as data as well. We have a level one variance that follows a log, log normal distribution, again with a, a mean and a, a standard deviation for it that will be input as data. And just like in the previous example, beta is unchanged. So the size of beta will be determined by the number of predictors in that matrix that we make. And it still has a, a mean vector and a covariance matrix, of which I will also use a very uninformative prior for. Questions on any of this? Yes? Yeah, how's it in the beta? I have a column, and there is the number of the betas I have. So the... The trick is to understand that the, the number of betas has to match the number of columns in the design matrix. And so because of the, if, if it does, if it doesn't, first of all, stand will break. It won't run. 
But if it does, uh, then this this term right here is able to do what's uh, um, again a matrix. Um, it's, it's a matrix product. And if you're not familiar with matrix algebra, it's okay. It's just have to make sure that the number of uh, columns in the matrix is the same as the number of betas in the in beta itself. Okay, but it's only about the number of columns and not what is in there. It's That's right. One in, there. That, in this case, it's one. When we add predictors, they will be another column. So each predictor forms a column, and I'll show that to you as we add the free and reduced lunch predictor, for instance. And the, the columns are empty, or they get added? They get added. So in the R code here, this part, you would form a formula just like you would if this was a regular linear regression, and R will do the rest for you to build that matrix. So all you have to change is the formula if you add a predictor, and that matrix will change on the right size. And then with this syntax, you'll take the, the number of columns of it and send that to Stan to understand it. Does that help a little bit? OK. Other questions? OK. Back here. So we now know what are our parameters. We've got beta, sigma, those were from before. We have a random intercept for each school, right? That is the actual u. And we have the standard deviation of those random intercepts. Now, here's something that's a little bit different in estimation from what happens in LME4, or in the, mac in the frequentist maximum likelihood or REML version of estimation. In REML and maximum likelihood, you don't see the u in the likelihood function, right? Because the likelihood function, when you have data that you, you can use this normal distribution for, you can write the likelihood function without u at all, right? So you can marginalize across u. In the Bayesian sense, how I've coded this, I've included the u to make it more consistent. <coughs> Technically, we could have made it more complicated and taken it out, but I wanted to, to keep it here to see the u itself. So we end up getting the u simultaneous to everything as well. And this is an equivalent model to what's happening in maximum likelihood. Can I ask a question? Please do. So can you go back up to the parameters? Uh, yeah. So if you are explicitly giving each school its own U as part of this estimation process, why do you need a separate parameter for the variance of the U's? Why can't you just like tally it up? Because the variance itself is a parameter. And tallying it up. Across the U's that you made. So tallying it up, you mean like calculating? Like calculate the variance of the use. Because we're Bayesian. And that variance is a parameter. And if we were to calculate it from the U, it seems that would actually be a maximum likelihood or least squares estimate. Okay. So that would make it partially Bayesian and not, we're doing this, and sometimes you've heard the word fully Bayesian. Everything is Bayes in this example. So uh, further from that, you have to think about it. If we did that, um, there's sort of a weird dependency because the prior distribution depends on the variance. Okay. And then if we're using the entity to calculate the variance that it then depends upon, yeah, there's a circular logic that would throw everything off the rails, perhaps. On the in a relatively uh, small number of parameter model like this, uh, it may not be a problem, but it, it could be. Any questions? OK. So now, what we need to calculate is a little bit more what we need data-wise. We still have n, but now we need the number of schools because that tells us how many u's we need. Uh, and we also need something to tell us which school each student goes to. So that is an integer in this case. We have, uh, if, the, if you would learn to look at the, were to look at the data, you'll see the number 1 through 62. We just have a, a label for the school, numeric. So that's an integer, and we know Stan doesn't like making vectors out of integers, so we have to use the, the term array for that, which is frustrating. Again, the number of predictors, P, in our X matrix. We have our X matrix also. We have our Y also, that's from before. Prior mean beta, prior covariance matrix beta, that's also from before. Prior sigma mean, prior sigma standard deviation from before. Now we have a few other terms we're adding. We are adding a prior for the random intercept standard deviation, prior mean, 
and a prior standard deviation. Yes. Instead, you just could define integer and real numbers. So the school ID need to be an integer. School, uh, school ID needs to be an integer because we're using it as an index variable. So here, school ID shows up within brackets, and its only job is to tell us which random intercept, referring to which element of the random intercept it goes to. So it will always be an integer, and Stan will, I believe, will not like that if it's a floating point number. It needs it to be. And the school name wouldn't work. That way, if I had to rename it, is because of that. It has a certain one. Yes, that's the other thing. <laughs> because um, here, our random intercept has number of schools in it. This is a uh, an array, a vector, like an R vector, and in Stan, the first element is one. So I had to make sure school ID starts at one and goes up to the number of schools. If we had a, um, a nominal number there, you know, like a, a six-digit school number or something along those lines, like an identification number that didn't have an order to it, we wouldn't be able to use that either. I hope that answers the question. Okay, finally, these last two lines we're not going to use in this model, but we'll use very soon. Lisa had described contextual effects and between effects when we start putting in different versions of centered level one variables with their level two components. And I believe you described how you can get one from the other sure. through separating, uh, through just a, 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 a linear combination. We sometimes call that a contrast in uh, linear models. And so I added that feature as well, although we're not gonna use it now, so I'll talk more about it later. It'll be empty. Finally, in the generated quantities, I would like to actually calculate the ICC from every step in the chain. If you think about it, one of the, one of the fun things about Bayes that you don't get in your output here, or maybe you do, let's see. You have an ICC here, it's 0.159. How much variation is in that ICC? I have no idea. Wouldn't you like to know? I would. Why? Because I'm trying to sell Stan. I don't know why I'm selling it. It's free. But that's one of the unique differences of Stan. You can, every type of term that you could form from your frequentist statistics. So if you think about it, we've estimated these two variances. Then we're going to go and put them into an ICC with a formula. Well, there's nothing stopping us from doing that for every iteration of Stan with our current estimates. Right? And now what we'll end up getting is a posterior distribution of the ICC. So I think that's a unique feature of Stan that I enjoy, um, or the Bayesian, uh, the sampling procedures that we're doing. So the ICC, as you know, um, is the variance, the um, between school variance over the sum of between school variance and within school variance. And in this case, because each of these terms in Stan are standard deviations, I had to square each of them to make them variances again. And again, we have our Person likelihood, which we'll use for leave one out calculation. I will not talk about contrast just yet. We'll do that a little bit later. Questions? Okay, shall we? Why do I ask that? I don't want to know the answer. Let's do this. I'll just be more enthusiastic. Does enthusiasm help, or should I just be sort of monotone, quiet? No, enthusiasm. I, I don't know. That's the thing. I don't like selling things. I'm a terrible salesman. <laughs> terrible entrepreneur. That's why I'm in science, right? <laughs> um, okay. So again, we can compile the model. Um, I'm not going to compile it. Again, I'm just going to use the save results so we don't have to sit and wait for it. Here, again, the formula is just an, an intercept. This is an empty model, two-level model, where we have a fixed intercept, and that's what this formula is going to give us. And a, a model matrix uh, does just that. We have our data. Once again, I'm using the same prior for each of my variance components. Um, this is sufficient. I believe this prior to be sufficiently uninformative, so that it does. It, even though we wouldn't expect the two variances to be equal, it's within the range of where the variances are. It's going to be very. It's not going to do much um, harm, if you will, um, moving them in one way or the other. And I'll note the number of contrasts is zero, so that shuts off that part of the code that we would use to form those. 
So let's load the data. And here, that is our R hat, maximum R hat. That looks pretty good, right? Okay, let's take a look at our estimates. Here, um, residual standard deviation, 2.36. Uh, random intercept uh, standard deviation, 1.05. And now the ICC, now the EAP estimate of the ICC is 0.165. That is different than what we see here, slightly. Right. 0.159. Anybody want to guess why it might be different? See this. Yeah, it's the penis. So let's do a little uh, more inspection real quick here. See if I can do this. Here we are. That's ICC. Let me plot this. This is our distribution, our posterior distribution of the random intercept standard deviation. It's not entirely symmetric. It's a little bit skewed. And we would expect this because we have we're basically taking a standard deviation with 62 observations. Right? We have 62 schools. So remember, um, we don't talk about a lot, well, at least in where we teach our linear models class or our elementary statistics class, we talk about like sampling distributions of a mean. We know that forms a normal distribution as n goes to infinity. Um, the variance also becomes normal, but it takes longer. Right? So for, for finite samples, you'll see a sampling distribution of the variance that's not uh, symmetric. And the same thing is happening here. So if we were to look at the ICC, the same plot, this is our ICC plot right here. It's a ratio of variances. That is not symmetric. And the number that you see in the output here, the mean, 0.165, is its mean. So the mean is slightly toward the tail from where the mode is. So part of the reason why we the mean estimate for this is a little bit higher is because the tail is bringing the mean up with it, just as you'd see in basic statistics. It's a skewed distribution. So if you look at the median for it, <laughs> the median is a little bit closer. But as you know with skewed distributions, right, the mode moves last, the median, and the mean. Well, it turns out when you take a maximum likelihood estimate, hang on one second here. When you take a li maximum likelihood estimate, if this were a likelihood function, the maximum is the peak. It's a synonym for the mode. We're not outputting the mode as an estimate, though. But that doesn't mean that our mode is th isn't this pot potentially the same as we would have seen in, other, in the maximum likelihood itself. So the maximum likelihood that Lisa had run would be like reporting where the peak of this is. Whereas in Bayesian, because it's difficult to calculate a mode numerically from a, a, dis, a smooth histogram, right? You have to somehow interpolate there. Actually, it's not difficult, but there's 37 different ways of doing it. If you want to check this out, there's a package in R called mode est. And literally, the number of methods that you could use, because at some point, what you have are finite observations, and how do you interpolate between the two where the most likelihood happens, the highest likelihood happens to be, is subjective at some point, right? It's not a smooth distribution itself. So we don't output the mode estimate, but had we had, estimate, had, we had output that, it would be fair, I would surmise it would be fairly um, close to what had been from the previous estimate as well. So, but what we do estimate though, and this is the fun part, this is fun, right? What's the variation around it? Well, let's take a look at our credible interval, right? So, yes, the estimate's 0.1, uh, what was it, 159 for you, 165 for me, 0.165 for me, excuse me. Our credible interval is between but the variation around it has a posterior standard deviation of 0.282. And if we wanted to put a credible interval, we would say it'd be somewhere between 0.123 and 0.215. How does that sound from a multi-level perspective? 
is it like is that still is that variation wide to you if you're like yeah the, the, the standard the, the ICC is somewhere in that range mm -hmm. is that good or bad it just is it just yeah, is all right so anyway I had I don't know I don't do a lot of uh, it's fairly high for cluster data I think so we have a lot of dependency within school I guess anyway any questions on this does that give you at least one little thought? Hey, maybe there's one reason I could use Bayes. No, thank you. Thank you. I have one. That's good. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right. Back to you. I will say that this thing um, I think is important to keep in mind when you see simulation research comparing, you know, ML this versus Bayes that. Some of the reasons for the discrepancy is because there's different types of estimates of central tendency being used to describe the parameters. So if one's a mode and one's a mean, like that's not putting them on the same scale. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind, I think. It was it was interesting. We were we go to a, a conference, not SMIP, but SMEP. With an E. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen this before, the but there's Society a Society of Multivariate Experimental Psychology. So Lisa is president of SMEP now and part of SMIP. So she's Smith and Smith. <laughs> but um, at that conference, I remember several years ago, we had this um, uh -huh. interesting discussion with a colleague who said, well, everybody knows the Bayesian estimates of variance are larger. Because, and, and I'm like, well, they're larger because what are you using as an estimate? Well, I use a EAP, a posterior mean. Well, that's drawn up. You know, if you have a smaller sample, guess what that? That's moving, being pulled, being skewed by the tail of the posterior distribution in a non-symmetric posterior distribution. So it's not a well-known feature of Bayes, but if you think about it from like literally summarizing a distribution, it, it, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. And things that you have actually have quite a bit of knowledge on if you've taken an introductory statistics course, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Okay, so somewhere between 12 and 21 percent of our variance in math sum score is because of which school you go to right the predictor that we're interested in then is binary whether a child receives free and reduced lunch or not so as a as a matter of process when i'm doing these things i would fit for any level one predictor i'm interested in the same series of models to see how much of what i'm calling a level one predictor is actually a level two predictor however this is a binary variable, so I can't just put it into Elmer. I mean, it'll let me, right, but is that a good idea? Should I use a standard linear model assuming normality and constant variance for a binary predictor? Probably not, but I can fix it, right? There's ways to fix it. So I'm going to do the same series of single level versus two level models for a generalized extension which will change from, rather than having a conditional normal distribution at level one, conditional Bernoulli, and to make sure that my predicted probabilities would not go outside of zero and one if I were to add predictors, I'm gonna use a logit link. So a logit version of a multi-level model. So I have the logit of the probability that free and reduced lunch equals one is given by my fixed intercept, which is given only right here. So this is a single level model because I don't have a U on it yet. And I also don't have something here that you would normally see. What's missing? Yeah, the residual. So I don't have an E in the equation because I'm not estimating a separate variance. The variance is going to be determined by the mean. So I'm using just a standard GLM within base R to do this. Fam family binomial, so Bernoulli is a special case of binomial for one trial with link equals logit. It's an empty model. So just free and reduced lunch gets a fixed intercept and that's it. And my intercept is negative 0.85. What's that? What scale is that in? That can't be a probability, right? Probabilities don't go negative. What's it in? It's a logit. It's the log of the odds of the probability of a one. So if I want to back translate that, mean inverse link function, I can type the shorter version of the formula, 
1 over 1 plus e to the minus 1 times what the logit is, which is hidden inside right here, then asked to print it, then I get a probability of 0.2977. That exactly matches the mean of this variable. So even if I'm not, if I'm eventually going to do a multi-level model or a complex version, whenever I'm in generalized modeling land, this is my first step. Because if I can recreate the mean of the variable, then I understand which way my model is parameterized. Some software packages will predict the logit of the zero response by default instead, in which case the intercept I would have gotten back is 0. 0.7. What? Seriously? Sorry. Like SAS does I mean, that. I'll by recreate. Just. Ugh. <laughs> And it's even worse when you get to ordinal models where you have cumulative thresholds maybe or intercepts maybe and you got to figure out which way it's going. Being able to map the empty model intercepts back onto your categories and know which way is up is the first step whenever you're doing any kind of generalized model that involves a link. So this is comforting. I know it's predicting the one. So here's the formula that I did in R to, to reproduce that. But now I want to see how much of the variation in binary, free, and reduced lunch depends on which school they go to. So I'm adding my friend U here, turning this into a two-level model. That means I need to move away from GLM and into, I'm going to go with Glimmer. Can I call it that? GLMer? I'm sure that's what they meant, but it looks like Glimmer to me. And I'm adding my random intercept here, whose variance will be estimated. So now I have an intercept variance of 1.89. Note what's not on the output that would normally be right under this. Residual variance, right? It's not a thing. However, in the model scale, we can borrow the idea of residual variance from the underlying continuous logistic distribution that is secretly there that we don't have access to that gave rise to the binary outcome, the Y star, if you will. So if I'm willing to do that, then I can substitute pi squared divided by 3 as the residual variance, and I can still get my intraclass correlation the usual way. So intraclass correlation then, if I put in random intercept variance divided by that by 3.29 as the placement for the residual, gives me an intraclass correlation of about 37%. So 37% of all the reasons why some kids might get free lunch and some kids might not has to do with what school they go to. So there's a commonality in the resources available to, to the students. I also note, though, that if I back translate the fixed intercept into probability, it's not the mean anymore. It is a different number. It's 0.23 instead of 0.30. That's because it doesn't mean the same thing. In multi-level models where we have something on the bottom that's not normal and a normal variable on top, the interpretation of the fixed effects is no longer the mean. It is conditional on a school with a random intercept equals zero specifically. So this is the expected proportion of children who, this the logit, hang on, let me back translate. The model gives me the logit of the probability, which corresponds to the proportion of kids who get free and reduced lunch in a school like, like that. So it is called unit specific. So that's just one little catch that you have to keep in mind in interpreting your fixed effects is that they are conditional on the corresponding random effect being zero. That means it's not going to be the exact same number. Um, according to Walt Stroop's generalized mixed effects modeling book, this is something like the median instead of the mean. So it's still in the middle-ish, but mean is not the right term anymore. But point of the story, I have 37% of the variability in what I thought was a level one student characteristic is actually a level two school characteristic. And that means I need to worry about smushing when I put it into the mall. And that is significantly different than zero. Because I used two different types of R routines, I did the likelihood ratio test myself. So minus 2 times the log likelihood from the single level model minus the log likelihood from the two level model gives me a chi-square test statistic of 582. So yes, 37% is greater than 0. And now for Stan.
I realized I didn't do the uh, model comparison the last time, but I'll do it this time to, to connect everything as well. Or at least I'll try to. Bit forgetful in my advanced age. It happens. Okay. So, now, actually, well, here, I can do it now. The loo compare function, LOO compare function, will do this, and the preferred model is on top, random intercept. So this tells you random intercept. This is from the last time, not the generalized, but it was right there, so I thought I'd impulsively run the R syntax to do this. Um, the difference is, uh, this is, this is it, the, the expected log posterior density difference, this is the negative, is negative point, negative 237, 239.7, and the standard error of the difference is 20. So if you think about that standard error of the difference, that tells you how certain it is. And if you wanted to, you know, put some type of interval around this number, you could say plus or minus maybe even two times this if it were normal. I don't even know if it is. I don't know that just full enough. But let's pretend, because everybody likes plus or minus two times the standard error, uh, it would not come close to zero. So that means we have fair, fairly good confidence that um, what we're doing is uh, we have the, the better model in um, the random intercept from before. And unlike last time, our, um, I was trying to see the number of, all Pareto, all estimates are good. Remember last time they were very bad? These are good. <laughs> so we have better confidence in our model comparison. So, okay. So let's do the same. Now we're going to grab model 03, uh, 02, model 03, the third stand model from this section. And this is the empty model for a logistic regression without a random intercept. So it will look very similar to the empty model for the normal distribution of y without a random intercept. And here, the difference will be, instead of a normal distribution, we change to Bernoulli Logit. Remember Bernoulli Logit we use in IRT, right? So Bernoulli Logit, what it does is it takes the inverse link function, e to that over one plus e to that, the term in the parentheses, and you then applies a Bernoulli distribution with that probability for each observation of y. And just like the last time I showed you this, x times beta, x again, is our design matrix. Right? So it will be just a column of ones again. Same thing that we used in the model before. Uh, beta will be the same, have, have the same number of elements as the same number of columns of x. So there's one beta in this case. But y itself has to be a 0 or a 1 to make Bernoulli logit function. Right? It expects it to be there. Last time, y was normal. This time, y is not. Um, so again, we have the same set of parameters. The only thing different, as we mentioned before, is there's not the level one, or excuse me, in this case, it's not two levels. It's the residual standard deviation. That doesn't exist, right? Because we're in logit land. So we don't have that, or Bernoulli distribution doesn't have it. Uh, similar to last time, we'll calculate the person likelihood from this to see a model comparison between this with or without our uh, random intercept. And just like what Lisa had shown just at the end, we will go and back translate our first element of beta to a probability so we can actually get the probability that we can see if it matches our data as well too. So I'm just applying the inverse uh, logistic link function to go from our intercept back to probability scale. Any questions on this code? Now, would you admit this is a subtle difference, right? This isn't too different. I mentioned this because I heard from Lisa last night, somebody wanted to debate between us about whether you should use STAN or not for generalized models. <laughs> I wanted to say this is a generalized model. No, it wasn't generalized, just in general. In general. Yeah. Well, I thought, well, for generalized models, there's not a lot of difference, right? So anyway, moving on. Um, going back to the STAN syntax, uh, again, we use the same model formula. So remember, x, the design matrix, is the same, right? Whether we're predicting a log odds, a logit, a Bernoulli variable, whether we're predicting a um, continuous variable with y and a normal distribution, whether we have counts, 
design matrix, design matrices are the same. And that gets back to the, remember the first few moments of Tuesday, which to me feels like two weeks ago, um, that we talked about like left-hand side of, the, of an equation are data, uh, right-hand side is theory. The design matrix represents your quantification of your hypotheses in your theory. And so this is sort of enacting that idea. The only difference is how do we map the theory onto the space of the data to provide evidence for or against the hypothesis, I guess really against the hypothesis in this case. So you can see all of this. I don't think there's anything in here that's any different that I need to show you. So I will load the result. Let's take a look at R hat. Anybody want to guess the number? <sighs> Converged. I wish I would see that from model, the model that works is coming. But it's coming. Um, let's take a look at the results. The result here is, this is beta. Actually, I want to have, add to this probability. So beta, again, is negative uh, 0.861. Lisa, your beta was, eh, not too close, a little bit close. That is, is that the, uh, the empty, that's yeah, GLM, okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's not exactly the same. Close Pretty close, and then um, the point estimate of probability, uh, 0.297. That is where we need it to be, and you can of course see a interval around that as well too. Any questions? Okay, moving forward. Yes? Just ask again the, maybe I don't get it, just remind me the um, hidden sigma variance. Why it's pi squared divided by three? Oh, can I? Can you pull up Wikipedia? Let's go to Wikipedia for this one. <laughs> <laughs> you may be here at the University of Mannheim. But let's go to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> we could do that too. As for the logistic distribution. Otherwise, I could pull up a slide from my website. But no, that, so what we're looking for here is the distribution function itself of, of the logistic distribution. Go ahead, Lisa. No, that's right. This is why. Right here. Pi squared over 3 is the variance of the logistic distribution with the scaling thing that must be 1 if it's talking about a binary variable. That's why. Because math. So when, when on that, I know it sounds weird, but on that, um, that model itself, because we're predicting the logit, there is a variance if we all only had logits, and that's what it is. And so there, there you have it. Uh, by the way, if we switch to a probit link, if, we, if the, it was a z-score that corresponds to the probability, then the pretend variance of the underlying normally distributed variable be, would be 1 instead. So you put 1 in wherever the residual variance goes in that case. But the fixed effect is rescaled. <laughs> we, we're not going to do probits today. No, but yeah. just for those of you familiar with item response theory, particularly early item response theory, uh, in the two-parameter model, Probit came first, like 1950, and then throughout like um, the very old textbooks like uh, Hamilton and Swami Nathan, no, you'd have a scaling constant, right? 1.7, 1.701, depending on who you talk to, to try to make the logit version mirror what you see in the probit version. But what that ends up meaning is because the scale differs, everything changes because of it. Okay, it's not on. Because you're not going to the right place. Oh, I can't see. No, oh. it's not. Huh. It ain't working. There it is. Okay, there's me in the shirt that I'm not wearing today. <laughs> um, so in my, I teach generalized linear models as like the second semester version of our sequence. I've got a, I need my mouse, as God intended. All right. In, so this is my class. I'm trying to get to... Lecture two, which is where, where did it go? There it is. There's a picture I want. How do I make this big? Green? Green. Okay. Scroll. All right. Here. 
Probe it versus loge it. Should you care? No. So the idea is that the pretend underlying continuous variable that gave rise to the actual binary variable, we could say is normally distributed with a variance of 1, or we could say it's logistically distributed with a variance of 3.29. Which is pi squared over 2. Which is pi squared over 3. But if you translate them by the difference in that scale, this is the difference in prediction that you get. And I don't know about you, but I can't see the difference between these two lines mattering. So they're on different scales, but there's no difference in the predicted probabilities that you get when you back translate out of that. So by the way, probit is ogive, an item response theory world. That's the connection of these two. So, and there's no odds ratios in probit, which is one of the reasons I like it better. And by the way, this is the log log versus complementary log log that Jonathan mentioned on the first day. The difference is that the complementary log log follows the same curve until it gets halfway through in which it goes asymmetric. So this is for outcomes in which you have way more zeros and you're not really sure about predicting the one side because you don't have that many ones. Whereas log log does the opposite. It's for outcomes where one is more frequent and so you've got the curve following up to that and then it kind of stops because you're not sure about the zero side. And those have pi squared over six Yes, of course. pi squared over 6 is the pretend underlying distribution because it's skewed instead. And you can look that up on Wikipedia, which I put a link to right here, because that's how I teach. There. there. Digression over. Ah, the gumball distribution. It's the extreme values distribution also is what it's called. So, how about that for information? You asked. <laughs> We're going to discourage <laughs> questions. <laughs> No, we're not. It's a good thing we're talking about statistics and not politics. But, but now you see why in my book I only had like a nod to generalized models in the very last chapter because it's already 576 pages and I didn't even talk about logits yet. So like everything you do about multi-level is exactly the same for generalized, just with all of this added complexity like underneath it of logits and probabilities. Are we back? No, I'm not done yet. Okay, we're not done. Okay, but if you wanted the computer. I'm done. Okay, so now we need to add the random intercept. You're going to see a very similar set of syntax. It's uh, 0, 02 model 0, 04 right here. Let's start with the model section. Again, we add, we first take and loop over all of the y observations. Uh, and that is because you know, we have our fixed effects here in x times beta. But then we add a random intercept as well. So that random intercept is our U term. And because of that, just like previously, it depends on it. We need to tell it which U to use. There's 62 U's. Everything else about this code, with the exception of we don't have sigma, we don't have a level one variance, is the same, right? We have random intercept follows a normal distribution. It has tau intercept as its standard deviation. There's a prior distribution for that tau intercept. Uh, and finally, under here, uh, I'm still going to calculate the probability, like Lisa did, uh, is a generated quantity. I'm going to calculate the ICC, so we'll have a nice range to the ICC. And here, uh, I take, there's a pi function in STAN, which gives me pi with many more decimal places, and I don't remember them. Does anybody have, how many decimal places of pi can you remember? That's, those are nerd games, right? Those are <laughs> party games that you can play with graduate students or faculty. But anyway, <laughs> I have like two, 3.14. After that, I don't go any further. Yeah, but the, uh, what? One five? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Anybody can, what's after five, the five? <laughs> anyway, but that's nice because I don't have to go and type it. It'll go further than that, right? So that's nice. Uh, pi squared over three. So again, uh, it's between variants over between variants plus our weird within variants. Just call it, can we admit this is weird? It's like. Um, you know, there are times in statistics where you'll see like a 6 in a numerator or something. Like, where did 6 come from? Like, why did pi squared get divided by 3? That type of thing. But that's, that is what it is. Finally, we have our person likelihood below. Any questions on this syntax? I know I'm going a little bit faster, but that's because I'm sort of building on, building up the scaffolding, building up the ladder of, of what we're trying to get to. Okay, I don't see questions. 
So let's uh, see everything else is as it was before. I'm going to grab the results. Let's take a look at convergence. A little bit worse, 1.01, .01, but still well within reasonable limits. And here, I actually need to print out the probability as well. So now, here is our results. Beta is negative 1.19. At least, so what was your beta? It was negative 1.18. So very close. Not, I wouldn't, I'm not fretting too much about being different. The probability you output was 2.34. We have 2.35. That seems pretty reasonable. Uh, finally, the uh, the ICC 0.365 hours is again slightly higher, but again we're reporting the mode and not the median. Or sorry, not the mean. We're reporting the mean here, not the mode as you would in yours. And not only that, it's within the same range. And now we can see the variability around it as well, somewhere between 0.295 and 0.466. That's a lot, that's a big ICC, relatively speaking. So, uh, this speaks to sort of our crazy public education system in the United States, where um, it's state by state, first of all, and then a lot of schools get funded by their local areas that they're in as well. So they have a component that comes from the, s the federal government, some from the state government, and some from the local government. And the local governments are the places where if you have a lot of people who do not have a lot of money, there will not be a lot of money going to the schools. And so that is part of the, the weirdness of all of it. How am I doing? I think I'm done. Your turn. Questions? Any questions? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> After diving down to get to the Weeble or Weibel distribution, <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, any questions? Okay. The floor is yours. All right, so now, predictors. So I'm going to show you something for the purposes of demonstration only, as you might imagine, with the title, Smushed Slope, for the type of model I'm estimating here. She didn't include in bold letters, do not do this. I didn't know how to do that in Markdown. So free and reduced lunch in the level one model all by itself without any corresponding level two part. This is going to assume without testing that the effect of within school variation and free lunch is the same as the effect of between school variation and free lunch in predicting math sum scores, giving it only a fixed effect for right now. So since we're pretending that this is continuous, and by the way, sum score is actually not continuous. I should probably be treating this as a count, but this was hard enough as it is. Uh, we've got sum score equals fixed, fixed intercept plus free and reduced lunch, keeping my random intercept in the model. And here is what we get. So the variances have changed relative to the empty model without the predictor. I'll do a more specific comparison of those in just a second. Here are my fixed effects. So the intercept is no longer five something. It's changed to six. Coincidence or consequence of the model? Why has it changed? from the empty model with no predictors to a model with predictors. So now it's a predicted sum score for a person with a zero on the free lunch score. Exactly. It's a new, exactly right. It's a new number because it means something different. This is the expected sum score for a kid who does not get free lunch. If you are a kid that gets free lunch, what happens? Yeah, it's lower. So, yeah. yeah, it's lower by about one item on average. However, this is assuming that there is no contextual effect. That all that matters is that I need to know your status. I don't need to know anything about the school that you go to because that doesn't matter incrementally. So this smushed model assumes no level two contextual incremental contribution of your school environment. That's a testable hypothesis. To help illustrate the fact that this is probably a, an issue, 
We can compute pseudo r square for each variance component in the model. The formula is straightforward. It's what the variance was before minus what it is now divided by what it was before. So proportion reduction. We've got two different kinds of variance. We have our level two random intercept cluster mean differences. We got our level one residual person to person differences. Jonathan wrote a function called pseudo r square denator. That's quite a lot, but there's a long story. Yeah, it's a long, it's a whole thing. And that function has returned a pseudo r square for let's go here first sigma, which is level one residual variance of 0.03. So three percent of the student level variation in math has to do with free and reduced lunch status. However, forty percent of the school variance in mean math scores has to do with student free and reduced lunch. That's your giveaway that this model is smushed. The only way that a level one predictor can account for level two variance is through the embedded level two variance in the level one predictor. So when you're reading papers and you get to the results section and they report a change, a reduction in variance at level two from level one predictors, you know the model is smushed. If you go to their table of parameter estimates and you have variables at level one that do not have a counterpart at level two in the table and they didn't mention any kind of centering that would solve that problem, it's smushed. So this is assuming without testing that the model has fully captured all of the, rel the, the variation in common between free lunch and math scores at the student level and at the school level. That's an empirical question. So. Everything I just said, basically in complete sentences here. So how do we fix it? We unsmush it. So I'm leaving in binary free and reduced lunch. So I am not partitioning its variance by brute force. I'm not doing the preferred method because it's binary. What I'm going to do though is control for the school level variance in free and reduced lunch through a separate fixed effect. And note that I have school mean free lunch minus 0.3 in my equation here to convey to the reader that this is a centered predictor where the reference is a school that has 30% poor kids. So I've added one new fixed effect here. Which of my two piles of variance do you think this new fixed effect is going to explain? Is it going to have reduced E variance or U variance? If I add a school mean variable, is it going to reduce level 1e e or level 2u? Two alternatives, 50-50 shot. I heard it. Yeah, that was true. Yeah, the answer is always the one in its row. That's always the answer. So the extent to which schools differ in their proportion of students in poverty should further reduce the random intercept variance. So I'm adding in to my formula here. I keep free and reduce lunch at level one as my binary variable that has both sources of variation in it. I add a covariate of level two school mean free and reduce lunch centered at 0.3. And here's what I get. So the intercept is similar to before, but not quite the same because now it's doubly conditional. This is the expected sum score for a kid who does not get free lunch, who goes to a school where 30% of the kids do get free lunch. The coefficient for free lunch is similar to before, but it's not quite the same. Minus 1.04 versus the previous model, which is minus 0.18. Pretty close. That is pretty typical because there's way more information at the student level than at the school level. So the smushed coefficient, which is a blend of the two, is much more heavily weighted towards the level one slope. So you might say to yourself, well, what's the problem? Minus 1.18 versus 1.04? Like, close enough, right? At level one, yes. At level two, no. So another way of saying it is that the smushed model 
says the within slope is minus 1.18 and the between slope is minus 1.18. So the misspecification is in the level 2 model. That's where the problem is coming in. Our new school mean predictor, because it is being added to a model where the level 1 predictor contains both sources of variation, it does become the pure within effect, the minus 1 point, minus, I can't, I'm like out of gas here, minus 1.04 is the pure within effect. This thing is the contextual effect. So it means after controlling for whether you get free lunch, this is the extra incremental contribution of going to a school filled with poor kids or not. So this coefficient is pretty big, minus 3, where the full range of this sum score outcome is 0 to 10. Is that surprising? To me it is, until I think about what the slope means. A slope is always the change in y for a one unit change in x. What is a unit here? This is the proportion of students who get free lunch. It's the comparison between a school where nobody gets free lunch against where everybody gets free lunch. Exactly right. The, a proportion ranges from 0 to 1. So a one unit change is the difference between a school that has no poor kids, zero, and all poor kids, 100%. So what I could do to make this a little bit more interpretable is move the decimal place over and say for every 10% more poor kids, the school mean math score goes down by 0.3. You're allowed to do that kind of thing. You can mess with your fixed effects to make them a little bit more interpretable. So this is the extra contribution of the school that you go to beyond your individual status. That's one way to think about the contextual effect. Another way to think of it as this is the test of smushing. The previous model assumed no incremental contribution of the school. The fact that this coefficient is very large and very significant means that there is an incremental contribution that you shouldn't just have one slope, you need two. So free and reduced lunch here is the level one with an effect. The slope associated with school mean free and reduced lunch is the level two contextual effect. To get to the level two between effect, I add them together. And by I, I mean make R do the math for me. Because I can get out my calculator and add them no problem. But my calculator is not going to give me a standard error or a p-value that goes with it. So a linear combination of the fixed effects can be provided by contest 1D. Have you seen this before? No? Okay, this is one of my favorite things. I did not know this was a thing until way too late in my career, so I do this from the get-go in my intro class. This looks like gibberish to me if you don't know what's happening under the hood. So what these three digits are, are representing are multipliers of the fixed effects in order in which they are provided by R. Not necessarily the order in which you write them. It rearranges interaction terms against my will. <laughs> but in this case, it is straightforward. So that's why I always put the one here, is to remind myself that that's the first place. So what I'm saying is, OK, I want a 0 to multiply the intercept, meaning don't use it. I would like to multiply the slope for level 1 free lunch by 1 and multiply the slope for level 2 free lunch by 1. And the fact that these are positive numbers means they're going to end up being added together. And so this is a linear combination of the fixed effects. Minus 1 plus minus 3 is the minus 4 right here. So minus 4.17 is the full level 2 between slope. The contextual effect that we got in the model is the difference between the two. So I'll say that again. Minus 1 is within from the model, the level 1 slope. Minus 4 is between down here. Minus 3 is the difference. So your model 
If it's correctly specified, we'll always give you the within slope, and you will either get level two contextual or level two between, and you can work backwards to get the missing one. They're linear combinations of each other. If I wanted to make a difference between slopes, can you guess how I might do that in this little piece of code here? If I wanted to test if one slope is stronger than the other, for instance. Watch carefully. That's it. So if you ever have hypotheses about which slope is bigger or stronger, you can ask for those types of slope differences. And this is the same logic that would allow you to get simple slopes as part of interaction terms, which we all can agree is a terrible name. They're difficult slopes, not simple slopes. Uh, you can get model implied mean differences among your alternative groups in a reference coding system this way. You can get anything you want if you know how to ask for it. All right. How are we doing? Yes? Can you explain again why you add those minus one to see which one is stronger? So in this context that we would not need to because that wouldn't make sense. But as a general principle, if I wanted to ask for a combination of slopes where it was one minus the other to test their difference, I would put a minus one. And what it would give me would be the third entry minus the second entry. And that statement would give me the result of that operation. So the values are multipliers of what the slopes end up being in the stored output. Does that help at all? Maybe it will. Okay, we'll do it for real after, the, after lunch. We'll get to those models later because I'm going to have a within between model and then I'll subtract to get the contextual. So I'll show you the reverse of this operation. But in this case, the stronger means that like the bigger one is stronger? Or It, so, it, like it, which one has a stronger factor yeah. performance? Yeah, so um, as an example, so one of my homework assignments that I make has um, the prediction of whether or not you get a job out of graduate school based on the number of papers you have versus the number of posters you have. And one of the homework questions is, what's the difference in those two slopes? Which one should you invest more time in, basically? Mm -hmm. And so because they're in the same unit of number of somethings, I can actually contrast the size of the slope from one variable minus the other. And so that minus one, one combination would give me the difference in the slopes between those two predictor variables. Not better. OK, I'll, I'll just stop I talking. I just to... Yeah, it's the point being, this is a general procedure for asking for linear combinations of intercepts and slopes that answer subsequent questions beyond just the way your model is phrased to answer directly. That, that's the big picture. Sometimes it's called a contrast. I don't know if that is familiar to you at all, but it, it is, it is, it starts to get, uh, without the specific use case, it starts yeah. to lose its, like, why are we doing this? And I think in this mm -hmm. situation, we want to add them together to get the, the between effect, but the difference doesn't make any sense. Okay. Yeah, and not, I wouldn't do that in this case, but I'm just saying one could put minus, minus signs in here to make differences, broadly construed. So, Question. yeah, um, do that. So I, I assume you, as a wrapper, you have the LMER test package loaded? Yes, yes. And uh, I, I just read an entry of Ben Balker, and he not recommend to show p-values because it's not clear how to compute the decrease of freedom. I, I don't know if you have a strong opinion on doing or not doing um, So I have, I've asked for Satterthwaite degrees of freedom, which I've sort of glossed over because that's not a thing in Bayes land. Um, but I will note like the differences here, right? So the reason that this one is so much different is because this is a level one variable and this is level two and the degrees of freedom tend to map that. Um, but once we make free and reduce lunch, add a random slope to it, then its degrees of freedom here would look more like level two as well. So it somehow computed degrees of freedom for the comparison and those degrees of freedom look more like level two because this is a level two slope that it's making. And if I could add about whether you should, there's a long history of this. So yeah. Sabbath weight degrees of freedom from 1940s. Uh, the one I would choose if I had options to in R would be something called Kimworth-Roger, 
which is a more recent addition to the literature. Um, but once you, I think the question is, there's no uniformly standard way of understanding what degrees of freedom are when there's dependency in the data. And I can understand why that might be the perspective of why we shouldn't have the p-value for it. But that being said, I think it's fairly, in, in mixed model literature, I think most people are frequentists, most people want the p-value there, and I think the Kenwood Roger statistic would probably give you something very similar to this. So I don't, I don't necessarily feel bad about it. But then again, um, you know, uh, Douglas Bates, who created LME in the first place, at first didn't have any p-values at all because he thought p-values were garbage. So you know, there's, there's a whole number of reasons why someone might not want a p-value, and I'm not sure what the what uh, your colleague would, would say which one is the reason for this. Is it because of the p-value? Is it because of the way of summarizing dependency in the data? And I don't know the answer for that. Yeah, I mean, all of these p-values switch to scientific notation, which is your clue that, like, you, you would probably not come to a different conclusion based on whatever degrees of freedom you were trying to do, or none at all, for that matter, right? If you just reported it as a z. How about this? When I go to Bayes, you can see if zero is in the credible interval. <laughs> Six of one, half a dozen of the other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so putting words on this, this coefficient that I've asked for that's added the two together, the minus 0.4, for every unit higher proportion free and reduced lunch, mass score goes down by 4.17 items without controlling for free and reduced lunch of the student. After controlling for free and reduced lunch of the student, that effect is diminished to minus three instead. So the student effect is here. The extra effect of the school is here, yielding a total effect that's between down here. Said differently, point, uh, minus three is the difference between the slopes. That gives you empirical evidence that you should not put them together as one number and smush them. If we get to our square, so this is relative to the previous model. So adding just the school mean of free and reduced lunch is a new predictor. It has explained 71% of the random intercept variance that remains. It has explained no percent of the level one variance as it should because it's a school thing, it's not a people thing. So if I wanna get a total variance explained by free and reduced lunch overall, relative to the empty model, it works out to be still 3% at level one because the level one smush slope is very close to what the within slope should be, but 82% of the random intercept overall. So another way of thinking about it is really free and reduced lunch as a whole is responsible for 83% of the level two variance. If I didn't adequately model it though, I would come to the conclusion that it's only responsible for 40% very different. And by the way, foreshadowing, the fact that there is 82% of the variance in the sum score explained by this is why Jonathan's model 8 or 9 or whatever he's on is not working because the explanation of the between level theta, the theta variance is going to zero. And when that happens, Stan doesn't like it. But just think about what that means conceptually, right? Yeah. It's, if you think about differences in schools, there's 62 schools we have. They all vary in the average level of math ability. We're saying that we, we can explain some 82, 83% of that variability simply by knowing a student's proxy, you know, whether or not the student is receiving some benefit of, of, of free or reduced lunch, which is incredible. Like what, what, other, what other case have you seen with, these are real data. These are not made up. I sampled from a larger data set. Where do you see an R squared or a pseudo R squared of 0.82, right? That is incredible. It also speaks to an incredible amount of inequity in our educational system, which is also terrible. But it is an astounding number to me uh, from, a, from a point of view of, of what it means pragmatically or empirically. But if we want to talk about variance explained in sum score math, period, I can't say I explained 82% of the variance in math. That's wrong. What should I say instead? Because this is pseudo R squared. This is per variance component pile. 82% of what specifically? What does the random intercept represent? Is 
If you answer, I'll let us go to lunch. <laughs> Yes, between school mean differences. We have 82% of that. How much was between school mean differences in the first place? Do you remember the ICC? About 0.16 or so? So the correct way to say this is of the 16% of the variance that was due to school mean differences, 82% of the 16% is due to lunch differences between schools. 82% of the 16%. Likewise, I flipped that. The rest of, this, of the 16% is 84%. Of the 84% that was student to student variation in math within a school, only 3% has to do with whether that kid gets free lunch. And if your head starts to hurt in picturing how to explain to reviewers that you have 82% of 16% and 3% of 84%, this is the point at which you cry uncle and report total R square instead which is, of the variance in math, I got 15.7 of that. All put back together again. Now, can I add a little more context to that? In our crazy educational system, we use this assessment to establish whether or not a school is failing. Is that a crazy policy, or is it not, based on these data? <laughs> what it is saying, basically, if we explain 82% of the variance of schools performance, like average school performance, is due to something outside of Their education control. altogether. And then we use this data to then label schools as failing or potential for closing or whatever. Um, that seems a little bad because 82% of the variation is not within the control of the school at all. Right? Students are not randomly assigned to their schools. That's it. Yeah. So, so. It, is, it is, again, another indicator of, well, you see our, you see my, our country's PISA scores, or TIMS scores, right? We're not, a little bit lower, but that's, so, that's There we go. So. All right, so yeah, when you put it all back together again, it's 16% of the variance, the end. And if you did the math of 82% of 16% plus 3% of 84%, it would be close to that, but not quite. But that's a heuristic you can use. All right, questions? Lunchtime? Then more Stan? Yay. Wait, they're not coming back after that. <laughs> we have coffee. I wish my classes were catered, right? We have coffee. All right, uh, so we're back at 2 o'clock, 14 o'clock. <laughs> 1,400 hours. Yeah. Okay, let's do yeah, this. Recording.